Welcome to our third and final installment on our series on John Dee's 1564 text, The Monus Hieroglyphica. If you haven't seen the other two episodes, you may want to watch those first before watching this one. You can find a link to those two in the description below. In the previous episode, we explored the alchemical and Kabbalistic theories at work in the composition and structure of the hieroglyphic monad. First, we explored how Dee seems to have adopted a version of the so-called Mercury Alone theory in centering Mercury as the core symbolic and alchemical notion in the development of the hieroglyphic monad. As we noted, Dee is a bit too much of a maverick to rely on any singular one theory alone. Part of what makes the Monus Hieroglyphica so difficult to understand, at least in alchemical terms, is that Dee is standing between two radical traditions in alchemy. The first is a fourfold elemental theory inherited from Aristotle, and of course the mercury-sulfur theory of the metals developed in the Islamicate world. On the other side of the equation, Dee seems to be incorporating some avant-garde Paracelsian elements into the Monus Hieroglyphica as well. And just the degree to which his own Mercury alone theory in combination with the fourfold elemental traditional theory, along with the more avant-garde Paracelsian theory, explains to some degree at least, just why the Monus Hieroglyphica is so difficult to understand, especially in alchemical terms. Secondly, we explored how Dee incorporated elements from the Kabbalah into his notion of how the Monus Hieroglyphica was itself composed and developed as a symbol. Despite the fact that Dee's knowledge of Kabbalah was effectively second or perhaps even third hand by the 1560s, it's very clear that he incorporates many of the traditional hermeneutical and cipher techniques found in Kabbalah in the development and composition of the Monus Hieroglyphica as a symbol. These would, of course, include the famous permutation systems of Gematria, Siruf, and Notarikon. By adopting the idea that symbols have an ontological continuum with reality, D would begin to push beyond what he called the Kabbalah of what is said into what he notes as the Kabbalah of being. By leaning on ideas such as those found in the works of Pantheus, D begins to move beyond the so-called Kabbalah of metals to a Kabbalah of reality by linking semiotics, the study of representation and symbolism, to ontology, the study of being itself. And it's to Dee's conception of a Kabbalah of the real, or a Kabbalah of being, that we turn in this episode of Esoterica. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. There existed a long-standing debate that ran effectively through the entire Middle Ages among scholastic philosophers. When I say something like, Justin Sledge is a human, it's relatively clear that as an individual, I do in fact exist. Probably. But what isn't clear is just what it means to say that the category or genus human being exists. And the problem here is relatively apparent. If the genus or category human being doesn't exist, then how can I be a member of it? Many scholars in the Middle Ages argued that such categories were merely conventions or names. They weren't real entities, and we typically denote that camp as the so-called nominalists. The other camp, however, held that such categories must have some real existence for thus to use them as such. And the kind of reality ascribed to these categories ran the gamut, from merely mental entities to purely transcendental realities a la Plato. This debate was viewed as so important that the King of France directly intervened into the conversation. In 1474, Louis XI declared that only the realism of people like Thomas Aquinas should be taught, thus forbidding the nominalism of people like Occam, who you may know from his famous razor. In some sense, nominalism was seen as a metaphysical threat to the very foundation of Christian theology. Even the realism of the Middle Ages was relatively tempered by the moderating forces of Aristotle via Averroes. Here, the universals are said to be real, but were typically ascribed to a purely mental or formal existence, but that would soon radically change. With the importation of Platonic, Kabbalistic, and Hermetic ideas beginning in the 15th century, a new radical realism would begin to appear in European philosophy. 
Here, universal categories like goodness, beauty, and justice would become fully transcendental categories, but quickly a problem emerged. How does one use corrupt, fallen, sinful natural language to both describe and interact with these transcendental sublime entities? What was needed was a kind of prelapsarian language, which could bridge the gap between common everyday speech and these pure transcendental entities. It was Ficino that first argued that at least in ancient antiquity, such a language existed. This language, of course, was Egyptian, the language of the Egyptian sage, Hermes Trismegistus. It was in that ancient tongue that the symbols of the language itself not only represented the natural world around them, were in some sense mirrored from the divine realm itself. Ficino's notion here is radically platonic. For him, the mind of God doesn't operate discursively, but rather perceives pure forms in and of themselves. This radical platonic realism is a profound break with even the most expansive notion of realism from the scholastic period. What's also crucially important is that for Ficino, the divine and mundane world could be linked through powerful symbols. For him, talismans and amulets have the ability to absorb and concentrate power from the divine realm. And we can see the hermetic principle of as above, so below in Ficino's discussion on amulets in his De Vita. Here, heavenly powers can be concentrated into amulets by the use of powerful symbols, even in the mundane world. For Ficino, there was at least some connection between the symbols here in the mundane world with those found in the celestial and divine realms thus allowing for some semiotic or symbolic bridge between our world, the common world of language, and the divine world of the world of the forms. Such a trend would continue into Pico's theses, although in a very confused form. For instance, Pico seems to vacillate wildly on this issue, sometimes adopting a kind of nominalism, and then sometimes adopting what seems to be a very radical kind of realism. However, it's in his discussion of Kabbalah and magic there seems to be a definite and profound shift to the very kind of radical realism that we've already seen in Ficino. And it's there that we see the possibility that symbols and characters have the ability to contravene on material reality itself. And it's here that the figural seems to have an ontological priority over the material, and this is a full-blown inversion of nominalism though it remains mysterious just what kind of figures have this kind of ontological power over the material world. Though we are given some clue in the very Kabbalistic tenor of Pico's theses. And it's in the Christian Kabbalah of people like Reuchlin and Postel that we may perhaps find the answer. For them, the central figure that has ontological power over the material world is the four-letter divine name of God, the Tetragrammaton. For Johannes Reuchlin, for instance, the Yod of yod He vov He functions as a kind of geometric point from which all of being emerges. There, he describes the Hebrew letter Yod as a monad begetting a monad, reflecting itself in ardor, which unfolds itself as both existence and essence into the letter He, which is further set into what he calls a copulative conjunction with the letter Vav, this resulting in the final He of yod He vov He thus unfolding the very Baroque nature of reality itself. Further for Reuchlin, it's through the use of the fourfold divine name that scientists and artists were able to unfold the universality of the world itself. For him, the sages of old were able to discover the fundamental structure of reality, but worried that this idea would get out, they hid the divine name from future generations. It's also worth noting that these ancient artists and scientists who used the divine name in order to probe the divine secrets of reality, and who also hid the use of the divine name, that Reuchlin describes as hieroglyphers, or sacred writers, or perhaps writers of the sacred. The other great Christian Kabbalist who expanded these ideas from Ficino and Pico was Guillaume Postel, who Dee actually met. Postel made an almost identical argument about the Tetragrammaton, that is to say, that from the geometric point of the Yod, all of creation was unfolded. But he goes on to argue that Hebrew remains the most apt language to understand the fundamental secrets of reality, because it was, after all, the language by which God had spoken reality into being. For Postel, the Hebrew language still bore some ontological continuum with reality itself. And for him, the relationship between sign and signifier was by no means arbitrary, at least in the Hebrew language. 
Further, Postel even argued that Hebrew could bring about a kind of world peace. In his thinking, a universal form of Hebrew could be used to reunite all of Christendom with a new kind of Jerusalem to be founded in Venice. For Postel, not only did Hebrew have metaphysical power, but it could be used to in fact reform society and politics as well. One can be certain that Dee was living in the shadow of this radical, neoplatonic, and Kabbalistic realism. His radical innovation was to shift the conversation around which linguistic candidate was the best for either political or metaphysical reform, but to argue that all metaphysical and physical problems could be solved if this entire discourse was compressed into a single powerful symbol, the hieroglyphic monad. Here, the method of Kabbalah and the aim of alchemy could be united into a grand metaphysical synthesis. Here is where D argues that we must go beyond the Kabbalah of simply what is said to the Kabbalah of what is real, or the Kabbalah of being, in which sign, signification, and signifier are all united and harmonized before being set to the task of the reformation of wisdom and being itself. We can see this agenda on display in various places in the Monas Hieroglyphica. In Thesis 16, for instance, we can see how D derives both the structure of the alphabet and the system of the numerals from the hieroglyphic monad itself. What's crucial to observe in this is that for D, the hieroglyphic monad is itself ontologically prior to the alphabet and to numbers, including Hebrew in any form of restoration. Further, in Thesis 18, we see D using the Monas Hieroglyphica to not only represent the astral realm, but to actually reform the symbolic representation of that realm. And further, using these reformed astrological symbols to better inform how alchemical work can proceed, thus linking the metaphysical realm with the physical realm. Here we have D using the Monas Hieroglyphica to derive astronomical, alchemical, linguistic, and numerical representation. Further, because the Monas Hieroglyphica has this kind of ontological priority, it can be used to reform those various symbols and in turn, those disciplines themselves. For D, the Monas Hieroglyphica allows for the ideal representation of the celestial and divine spheres, a la Ficino. But because it represents those realms so ideally, it can also be used to reform those very disciplines, a la someone like Guillaume Postel. I would argue here that John Dee's Monas Hieroglyphica represents perhaps the most radical synthesis in the Renaissance of semiotics and metaphysics. But wait, there's more. Dee will go on to argue that because the hieroglyphic monad has such an ontological continuity with reality, that manipulation of the hieroglyphic monad, the manipulation of the symbol, will actually have an effect on reality itself. D seems to argue that because the hieroglyphic monad is such a perfect representation of reality, that one can actually decompose the monad into its various parts, and then rearrange those parts as a kind of simulation of reality itself, thus deriving the natural laws of reality and discovering hidden truths about the nature of reality from the symbol of the monad itself. In this way, the monad is a perfect representation of reality, and insofar as the internal symbolic aspects of the monad relate to itself, this is also going to be mirrored in reality itself. Thus, a decomposition and permutation of the various aspects of the symbol of the hieroglyphic monad can be used to discover the occult and fundamental structure of reality itself. Perhaps the most radical articulation of these claims can be found in both the preface and in Theorem 22. In the preface, it seems that D actually argues that one can actually forego empirical investigation of the night sky or into optics. Because the monad is a perfect representation of reality, it can prove as a kind of substitute for an empirical investigation. It seems that D is arguing that merely by peering into the Monas Hieroglyphica itself, one can forego standing outside in the cold and looking into an actual telescope. Further, it also seems that D believes that the hieroglyphic monad is also hiding breakthroughs in the field of optics. And these secrets can reveal a kind of mirror which has the ability to melt any metal whatsoever, thus creating a kind of James Bond laser gun thing. I mean, you do know that John D was the original 007, right? I mean, really, I'm not kidding. He really was 007. So, you know, laser guns? Sure, sure. Well, hermetic laser guns aside, we also see a very radical use of the Marnus Hieroglyphica in Theorem 22, 
Here it seems that D argues that the Monus Hieroglyphica can be decomposed into various elements of a kind of symbolic ontological alchemical laboratory. This would include everything from retorts and mortar and pestles to even a quote, small vessel containing the mysteries. These decomposed and recomposed elements of the symbol of the hieroglyphic monad can then be put into a kind of alchemical experimentation. Thus showing that for the hieroglyphic monad, there's no fundamental distinction between representation and the thing represented. D describes these both simultaneously real and symbolic alchemical vessels as being quote, completely Kabbalistical thus showing that for D, in terms of the Monus Hieroglyphica, there was no difference between the symbolic and the real. The manipulation of the symbol of the Hieroglyphic Monad bore directly on reality itself. This is perhaps the most radical use of the Hieroglyphic Monad found in D's thinking. Here, laboratory alchemy itself doesn't have to even be performed anymore. One can simply decompose the Hieroglyphic Monad into its various parts, and then run alchemical experimentation using the monad itself. Because the monad hieroglyphica is a perfect representation of reality, it blurs a line between representation and reality at all. One can simply do alchemical or astronomical research using the monad hieroglyphica rather than having to use a telescope or an alchemical laboratory. Here, the real and the symbolic have lost all distinction. Semiotics and ontology are merged. And it is at the end of the monad hieroglyphica that D reveals the full scope of his project. There, the Monus Hieroglyphica is profoundly unfolded to represent the very structure of reality itself. Here, everything from the horizon of the eternal down to the very basic elements of physical reality are revealed to be encoded and contained within the power of the Monus Hieroglyphica. The Hieroglyphic Monad is both a map of the cosmos, but in some sense a microcosm of the macrocosm of the cosmos itself. Dee's claim is nothing short than the radical reformation and renovation of reality itself the very idea found in the Kabbalah as tikkun olam, or the reparation of the world. Here, D argues that the unification of the monad with itself, which I suspect actually might mean D's discovery of the hieroglyphic monad, allows not only for the magus to discover the hidden truths of astrology, alchemy, or Kabbalah, but also allows his final grand vision, in which the monad hieroglyphica is the nexus between the microcosm and the macrocosm. For D, the hieroglyphic monad is a nexus point in which all reality is unified and harmonized. Here, the semiotic and the ontological are completely indistinguishable. They are, in this case, completely united. Despite the grandiose claims made by D in his 1564 Monus Hieroglyphica, we can say that they never quite panned out. In fact, when D published the work, the alchemist Libavius openly mocked his claims. It seems that D intended to write a rebuttal of Libavius, but never did. It's as if D, in some sense, had moved on from the grand project of the Monus Hieroglyphica. In fact, we don't even get a mention of the potential of the Monus Hieroglyphica in what would be the most conspicuous possible place, that is, in D's preface to the first English edition of Euclid's Elements, the classic textbook on geometry. Though, of course, I don't think D completely abandoned this vision of the unification between semiotics and ontology. As I'm sure many of you know, on March 10th of 1582, Dee would meet with a curious young man called Edward Talbot, later revealed to be Edward Kelly, and they would go on to elaborate conversations with supernatural creatures of all stripes. Dee would continue to seek out what he called radical truths by interrogating these various angels and demons to understand the basic structure of reality in the apocalypse. And it was in those conversations with angels that a language would be revealed to Dee and Kelly that was alleged to have profound metaphysical power. Here we can see a part of a conversation between the angel Gabriel and Dee and Kelly, where the angel describes the Enochian language as having almost the exact same kind of power as Dee's earlier Monus Hieroglyphica. And indeed, we shouldn't forget that part of the agenda of the conversations that Dee had with these angelic entities was the reformation not only of religion, but of the political world itself. These conversations are meant to be nothing short of a prelude to the apocalypse. For me, I see a philosophical continuity between the ideas that Dee had in the 1564 Monus Hieroglyphica and the kind of conversations Dee, Kelly, and the alleged angels had about the structure of language and reality for the many years they were in conversation with one another. It seems that Dee never really abandoned his desire to combine representation and being, the metaphysical and the symbolic. 
In the end, the monus hieroglyphica did not and probably could not do the kind of things D claimed of it. In fact, I think one is more apt to read the monus hieroglyphica as a symptom of the kind of philosophical problems that began in the 15th century in terms of representation and ontology rather than as a solution to those problems. Indeed, in some sense, the radical realism that would emerge in the mid-15th century would be relatively short-lived, at least in philosophical circles. Although it would go on to survive, although somewhat obscurely, in the world of theosophy. John Dee's hope to create an entire map of being itself would certainly not be abandoned, and the hieroglyphic monad certainly became the symbol of that great hope. And it is as a symbol, perhaps the singular symbol of hermetic philosophy itself, that the monad still endures to this very day itself representing a world in which the celestial and the mundane are finally harmonized. And in that way, John Dee's vision for the Monus Hieroglyphica endures and persists. If you're interested in a more in-depth semiotic analysis of the Monus Hieroglyphica using contemporary theories of semiotics, you might want to check out my thesis to be found in the description below. Of course, it's a bit technical being a thesis and all, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the comments below. You can also check out the bibliography there for a pretty extensive list of almost all the literature available on the Monus Hieroglyphica in many different languages. So if you want an extended bibliography, you can check that out as well. If you're interested in Hermetic philosophy, the history of magic, alchemy, and Kabbalah, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica. These are all mainstaying topics here on our channel. Also, if you find our content interesting, consider supporting our work on Patreon or the one-time donation. You can find those links below. Your support really does help make Esoterica possible. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.